Welcome everybody and thank you for joining part two of our tips and tricks webinar series developing portable pipelines using Whittle and Docker to develop locally and scale to the cloud. Today we're going to focus on uh, Whittle or workflow description language. Uh, my name is Carolyn Claude and I will be your moderator for today. I will spend a few moments covering some housekeeping items and then going over our agenda. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and sent to all registrants via email after today's session, so look out for that. You'll see a, a Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to type them in this Q&A box, and we'll address all questions in the last 15 minutes of today's session. Your speaker for today is uh, John Didion, Principal Scientist and Manager of Solution Architecture on the DNA Nexus Expanage team. John works with customers to design and implement solutions to complex informatics challenges on DNA Nexus. He has a broad background in the design and analysis of sequencing assays across the entire omics toolbox, including the use of clinical diagnostics, machine learning, and statistical genetics. John will pick up where he left off at the end of the first session and dive deep into writing and running portable bioinformatics workflows. If you missed the first session, please look out for a follow-up email from us in the next couple days that has the recording to today's session, as well as part one, which focused on Docker. With that, John, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Caroline. So as Caroline said, we're going to pick up where we left off on the previous uh, webinar. We were talking about Docker, and we talked about how to build and run our own, uh, create and and build and run our own Docker images. And today we're going to touch on one final point before moving on to Whittle, which is multi-stage builds. This is a relatively new feature in Docker, and it addresses the problem where we want to build one or more tools in a Docker image, but we don't want to retain all of the build time dependencies in our final image. So we can think of Docker images a bit like code in that we want to create some reusable modules each of which does one specific task. So for a bioinformatics example, we might want to build a BWA module with the BWA program in it. We might want to build a SAM tools module with the SAM tools binary in it. And multi-stage builds allow us to combine these modules with a bit of glue to create uh, images or, you know, if we're making the code analogy programs um, to, to combine all these tools together. So uh, multi-stage builds maximize the reusability of these in individual module uh, images, and they minimize our final image size. So that means that we speed up the uh, transfer of the image when we're copying it from a repository, or we minimize the storage footprint when we're storing it as a file on DNA Nexus. And so just to give a quick example of a multi-stage build, um, essentially what we're gonna do is build each of our Docker images separately, the way we described in the previous webinar. So here I'm showing an example where I'm bringing in the BWA image that we developed in the last uh, webinar. And I do that using uh, an additional from line. So I say from, and then the image name, and then I give it an alias. So I'm gonna call this BWA. So from DNA Nexus BWA image as BWA. I can also, in the same file, define an, a completely new module, in this case, SAM tools. So SAM tools, um, this will look very familiar from last time. We're basically doing uh, a Docker image here where I'm um, starting from a base distribution of Debian stretch slim, and I'm aliasing this as HTS, and then I'm going through all the steps to um, build uh, SAM tools. And then the last step of the multi-stage builds, the very last from command in your Docker file is what's gonna create your final image. And what I'm gonna do in this final image is simply copy the files and only the files that I need from these component images. So I'm saying copy from BWA, just the BWA binary. Copy from HTS, just the SAM tools binary. One thing to keep in mind is that some of these tools do have runtime dependencies. So in that case, you need to reinstall those in your final image. For example, SAM tools uh, depends on the Zlib uh, library and, and uh, the libcurses library. So we need to reinstall those. But we're, what we're doing is leaving out here um, GCC and all the other 
build time dependencies that we had installed in our uh, source images. So that makes our final image as small as possible. And then we can build our multi-stage builds the exact same way we build a regular Docker image. Um, in this case, remember that I've parameterized the versions of BWA and also SAM tools that we're building. So I pass those in as variables. I give it a tag. And I like to tag things using the name of the tool and the version of the tool that's included in the image. So these tags can get very long, but they're also very descriptive. I don't have to look in the Docker file to actually figure out what's, what's there. And then passing in the uh, variable values using the build arg option. And finally, the build context directory, which I'm just using the current directory. Now we'll go through a few steps. We'll see that uh, if you actually run this yourself, you'll see that the last step is copying those files over from the source images, generating a final image. Okay, so to wrap up, um, you have once you have a Docker image, there's two ways to use it on DNA Nexus. One way is to save that image to a file using the docker save command. And what this does is it creates a tar file that you can upload to DNA Nexus. You can gzip that tar, zip, tar file if you want to create an even smaller file. You do get a bit of uh, reduction that way. And then within your uh, native DNA Nexus applet, you can uh, first dx download that image file. Um, and the best way to do this is actually to have an input parameter and pass in the, the file, uh, the actual um, Docker image file as an, as an input parameter. That way you can easily change the Docker image that you use without having to rebuild your applet. And so once you download that tar file, then you run docker load on the tar file and that turns that file into an image on the local machine that then you can then uh, call using docker run. The advantage of doing things this way are it's the safest method because you're not dependent on any external services. For example, if Docker Hub were to go down while your app were running, your app would fail if it was trying to Docker pull an image from the Docker Hub website. You also have the fastest download speed this way because downloads within DNA Nexus are much faster than downloading from a, a, a repository somewhere else on the internet. And it's also more secure. Uh, especially if your image contains proprietary code, you would, might not want to store that in a public image. You might want to keep that privately within your own DNA Nexus project. The other way to do things is to push your image to a repository, use your Docker push, and then uh, at runtime, you just call Docker run on that image and it will do the pull automatically. Um, the advantage of doing this th things this way is that then you don't need to pay for the storage of that image file. But if you're using multi-stage builds to minimize the size of your image, um, the cost of storing the image probably won't be very much anyways. So we certainly recommend the, the first way of doing things, but the, the second way of doing things is completely supported. And to push an image, um, you just use the docker push command. You uh, say docker push and then the image name and that will upload it to your uh, to the repository. You may need to do a Docker login ahead of time if you're logging into a secure repository. For example, if you've deployed a uh, repository at your company that requires using credentials. On the other hand, to save and load an image, you would do Docker save, the image name, and this generates uh, a stream uh, to the standard out of the tar file, so you'd want to pipe that uh, uh, optionally through gzip to compress it and then save it to a tar or tar.gz file. And then to load that, you just do the inverse docker load and with the dash i option, give it the tar or tar gzip file and that will load the image into your uh, local docker uh, image cache. All right, so that's about it for uh, what we'll cover for Docker, and now we'll move on to workflow description language, or Whittle. What is Whittle? So Whittle is a domain-specific language for describing tasks and workflows that is independent of the execution environment. So this makes your workflows 
uh, portable. You can make your workflows modular using uh, imports, which is a topic that we'll cover. Um, your workflows are um, reproducible if they use Docker images, uh, which all of the workflows that you want to run on DNA Nexus need to use Docker images in order to, to work um, on our platform. And they're also shareable. So there are a couple of sites where you can find publicly available uh, Docker images. For example, docstore.org is a site that has lots of publicly available workflows in several different workflow languages. Here I'm at their advanced search page and I've just filtered things down to Whittle. So any of these workflows I could copy and run on DNA Nexus. And DNA Nexus even has an integration with DocStore. So I can go to a particular workflow that I want to run and click a button over here on the right hand side, DNA Nexus, and that will automatically import this workflow into my own project. So I don't even have to deal with the Whittle source code at all. Another source of uh, workflows is uh, GATK develops uh, Whittle workflows for all of their best practice pipelines and those can be found on their GitHub website. Uh, Whittle was um, developed for bioinformatics, but it's not specific to that. So if you do other types of computation, you can feel free to use Whittle as well. It was originally developed at the Broad Institute, but it is now an open standard, uh, openwhittle.org. And I recommend going to the Open Whittle GitHub site where you can uh, read the actual specification for Whittle. It's a fairly short and uh, information dense document. Whittle is not that um, complicated of a language, so it, it's uh, relatively concisely described and it won't take you very long to, to read through that and understand the full capabilities of Whittle. Today we're just going to be touching on the highlights. Um, consider this kind of a, a jumping off point for developing your own Whittle workflows. To run a Whittle workflow, you have several options. You can use a local executor like Cromwell, Mini Whittle, or Toil. I've included links to all of these in the slides here. Uh, Cromwell was the first and probably still the most popular of these executors. You can run it either on your local machine or in an HPC environment. And um, it has many, many uh, configurable options. Um, that we won't really touch on today, but they have pretty extensive documentation on their website. Or you can use DNA Nexus using our DX Whittle compiler. So a compiler, um, rather than executing the workflow directly, is going to take your Whittle workflows and turn them into native DNA Nexus uh, applets and workflows. So we'll see how to build a workflow using DX Whittle later in this webinar. So I have a sample workflow, very basic one, that I have developed using uh, just kind of like a hello world example using Whittle. We have a task here called say hello and a workflow called hello. So this is what a workflow, uh, a WDL file looks like. Start out with the version line. There are several different versions of Whittle 1.0 is the most recent, and if you're starting a new project, you should be using version 1.0. If I exclude the version um, line, it's going to assume that it is draft 2, which is the previous version of Whittle. Um, so you want to make sure to include that version line. A Whittle file um, can have any number of tasks in it, and at most one workflow. And you can split up your files really however you want. So I could put each task in a separate file and the workflow in a separate file. I could put all of my tasks in the same file along with the workflow. Um, we'll see later how to use imports to support um, uh, that modularity that allows you to divide things up really however you want. A task has four main sections. It has the input section where I'm defining the uh, task inputs the output section where I'm defining the task outputs, a command section, which is my script that is actually gonna get run. This is um, just bash, and this bash script is going to be executed inside a Docker image, or a Docker container, sorry. Um, 
and the Docker container is defined within the runtime section. There's other runtime variables I can define here that I'll get into later as well. A workflow has also has inputs and outputs. And then a workflow simply consists of calls to tasks. So for example, here I'm calling the say hello task and I'm giving it an input. And it's just taking this input from the workflow input and passing it to the task. And then my output is simply taking the task output and making that the workflow output. I know I'm moving a little quickly here. We'll go into all these things in more, uh, more detail in a moment. But this is what a basic workflow looks like. And if I have Cromwell installed on my computer, then I can run, um, then I can run this workflow. Cromwell is uh, written in Java and it's distributed as a jar file. So I need to go to the Cromwell website and download the jar file. Um, I like to create an environment variable that points to that jar file so I don't have to remember where it is. Um, the version is updated quite frequently. So, you know, just keep this environment variable updated with whatever the most recent version is. And then you simply do java-jar, the jar file name, the run command, and give it your word. So if you were to run this command with the hello workflow that I just showed you, you would see it fail. And the reason you'd see it fail is because it actually needs you to supply an input. Remember we defined name as a workflow input. So somehow I have to give Cromwell the, um, the value of the name variable. And the way I do that is using a file in the JSON format. JSON is, um, fairly simple way of just defining structured information. And the way that looks is I have open and closed braces. Um, and then everything in Whittle is referred to by dotted notation using namespaces. So hello is the name of my workflow. So that's the top level namespace. And name is the name of the input variable within that workflow. So hello.name, and I'm gonna give that the value of John. If I run Cromwell again, now using the dash dash inputs option and passing in this hello input uh, dot JSON file, now my workflow should run successfully. And um, what my workflow is actually doing is two things. It's echoing hello and then a name to standard out. And it's also writing that to an output file. So if I look at the outputs of Cromwell, I'll see that um, one of the outputs is a file with this uh, weird path. Um, that is the file that was generated by the workflow. You can uh, set up a specific place where you want Cromwell to put your outputs. By default, it just creates a temporary directory and um, all of the intermediate and final uh, output files are stored there. And then it just tells you where it's placed them. So to do that, I can set up another JSON file called options.json. And again, I would have to go to the Cromwell manual to see all our manual to see all of the options available to me. Just the one I'll touch on here, final workflow outputs directory. I could give it a specific directory where I wanted to put all of the outputs from my workflows. And then I would run Cromwell again using the dash dash options. Uh, uh, parameter with the options.json file. And now if I run this and I point it again at this outputs folder and I look at that outputs folder, you can now see that it's generated the hello file in that folder. All right, so let's talk about writing Widow workflows. Um, I've placed the link here to the Widow 1.0 specification. Again, I encourage uh, you to go and read that if you're gonna be writing Widow workflows. Um, we've talked about kind of the basic parts of a Widow file. The two parts we haven't yet touched on are imports, which enable us to bring in other Widow files as different namespaces. So when I showed you the inputs.json file, remember we talked about hello, being the top level namespace in the hello, work, uh, hello workflow uh, Whittle file. 
I were to import other files into that file, those would just be separate namespaces and I could access all of the workflows or tasks in those namespaces from, um, from the file where they're being imported. The other thing uh, I'll introduce are called structs. These are new in Whittle 1.0 and they allow you to define your own uh, types. So why would you want to use Whittle rather than just writing uh, a bash script or something like that? Well, uh, several reasons. Um, the inputs and outputs are formally specified and this enables the execution engine Cromwell to validate them to make sure that the the type of the data is correct and that you're not missing any required inputs. Um, it also simplifies using a Docker image. You know, nowhere in that Whittle task did you see any um, need to reference any Docker commands. We simply gave it the Docker image and Cromwell handles all the details of uh, pulling and running that Docker image and setting it up to run, um, run a bash script. So we can just focus on what we actually want to our, our task to do rather than needing to worry about the underlying details of how it's being executed. And it also enables the orchestration engine to parallelize task execution. So Cromwell can figure out what tasks can be run in parallel and it can run those. If it's run on a cloud environment like DNA Nexus, they can actually be run on separate instances so you get complete parallelization. Uh, if you're running locally, Cromwell would just use the different uh, cores if you have a multi-core system to parallelize those tasks. And so this simplifies running your workflow on uh, HPC and the cloud and makes, makes it possible to run the same workflow in any of these environments um, without having to code specifically for a cloud or an HPC type of environment. All right, so let's talk about some of the details of Whittle. Um, Whittle has five primitive data types that you're probably familiar with if, you're, if you do programming. So you have strings, uh, booleans, a true or false value, integers, floating point numbers, and files are considered primitive types. And a file is just described as a string that has a path in it. Whittle also has composite data types. So it can have arrays. An array, uh, it contains uh, one or more uh, values of all of the same type. So when I define an array, I have to define the type of uh, thing that it contains and define arrays using the bracket notation. So I could say array of int a, and then I can um, declare the value of that array here in, inside brackets as well, using commas to separate the value. And then I index into the array also using brackets. So if I wanted to, uh, Whittle uses zero-based indexing. So to get the first value in that array, I would say array zero, and that would give me the value one. A map is a mapping of keys to values. The keys have to be primitive types, but the values can be any type. So for example, I could have a map of strings to arrays of integers. Maps are defined using the are declared using the curly brace notation um, and then the colon to separate keys and values. So this sy syntax probably looks a lot like Python if you're familiar with coding Python and that's, that was uh, a very strong inspiration for Whittle. Um, the other type that's not used as much are pairs. A pair is a pair of values that can be uh, the same type or they can be different types. Um, this is sometimes also called a tuple. And you define a pair using the parentheses notation. So I could have a string integer pair. And the keys are the values are accessed using the left and right um, variable names. So p.left would give me hello. Widow inputs are defined in a block in the task or workflow that's called input. So within the input and then the open and close curly braces, I would define all of my workflow or task inputs. I can define variables uh, and, I, and actually need to declare variables if they are outside of the input block. Um, the difference being that uh, these variables outside of the input block are not overridable by 
the user. So anything in inputs can be um, overridden by the user, even if it has a default value. These have to have a value that are not overridable. So here we can see that I've uh, defined a few different variables. Name, age um, is an optional variable, and that is uh, determined by this question mark after the type. So I would I have the option of whether or not to pass in age, and my task would have to deal with the case where age is undefined. I can also provide default values. So here I'm giving a default uh, SSH key to use if the user doesn't override it. I can also, for array types, use the plus um, annotation to say that it needs to be non-empty. So pets would have to be an array having at least one value, but it could have more. Um, this actual age variable I'm defining here is showing the first usage of uh, a Whittle function. Whittle has a standard library of around uh, 20 to 30 functions that you have access to. Currently, there's no way to define your own functions in Whittle. Select first takes an array parameter and it returns the first value that is not undefined. So this is a common way, uh, an alternative way to define default value values for optional parameters. So what it would say is actual age is this age parameter if age was defined. Otherwise, we give it a default value of 42. All right, so I mentioned structs. Structs are user-defined data types, and they can be arbitrarily nested. So, you know, I could have a, um, if I define two different structs, um, I could have a, uh, let's say I had a person and pet as two different structs. So within my person struct, I could have an array of pet uh, variables. Um, in structs, you can't define um, optional, or, or sorry, default values. The only, uh, so structs are only for uh, declaring um, uh, um, variables. So here I have a person struct with a name, an age, and an optional uh, SSH key. And then structs are declared using the, um, the kind of object notation. So open and close curly brackets, and then mapping keys to values. So this is how I would define a default value for the person uh, input parameter. All right, so I've written this simple task here to do uh, sort using the SAM tools. And um, I've defined three inputs, a BAM file, an optional Boolean, which is tells me whether or not the BAM is sorted in name order, and then a uh, sample name, which is a string. So I'm going to use this for my output, um, naming my output file. See again an example of using select first to say that the name order is by default false unless the user has overridden it. And then within the command block, so the command block starts with these three um, open carrots and ends with these three, or sorry, these three um, less than signs and ends with these three greater than signs. And within that, I'm gonna put a bash script. And within that bash script, I can refer to variables that I've defined in my task using this, uh, this tilde and then open brace, close brace notation. And I have a variety of different types of expressions I can use within these braces. So I can just refer simply to the variable names like this. So this would be substituting in whatever the value of BAM is at this place in the script. But I also can do things like this and if else. So I can say if name order is true, then I insert the dash n option. Otherwise, I, I just use the empty string. Um, and then I'm piping the output to a file that is um, part of the name is determined by the sample name parameter. So this is sorting a BAM file, and then I'm finally going to run SAM tools index to index that BAM file. You also see this first line here, set dash uexo pipe fail. 
Um, this is a common pattern in bash development that um, makes your commands run a little bit more nicely. So uh, for example, um, B is echoing out any commands that are run to standard out so that when I look in my logs, I can see exactly which commands were executed. Uh, o pipe fail makes the command fail if, if you have a pipeline where you're using the, the pipe character to pipe together a bunch of commands. And fail will make it fail as soon as any one of those commands, uh, piped commands fails. And then as far as defining outputs of my Whittle task, um, I can use expressions there as well, or functions there as well. So um, I can use variables to define my, uh, for example, an output file. We saw in the command block that we use the tilde notation, that's specific to commands. Everywhere else, we, we use the dollar sign notation to refer to variables. So here I'm defining the output BAM file as being sample name, whatever the sample name is, and then dot BAM, and similarly the index file. Um, I can use a function called glob, which does a kind of a, a bash glob expression to find, in this case, any file with the dot VCF extension and create an array of files out of that. And then finally, I can use the standard out function to take the um, contents of the standard output of whatever command that I ran and store that to a string uh, output parameter. The last section we'll talk about in the task, little task is the runtime section. This defines the resource requirements of your task. Uh, the keys are arbitrary and they're ignored. If the, if the engine doesn't recognize them, it will just ignore them rather than failing. Um, but there are several keys that are used by convention. So we saw one already, which is the Docker key, which defines the name of the Docker image to use. A few more are CPU, memory, and disks, which define the number of CPUs, uh, amount of memory, and the type and the amount of disk space that you want to request. Um, it's up to the engine about how to interpret these or whether to interpret them at all. It can ignore them if it wants. But uh, for the most part, Cromwell and, um, and definitely the XWiddle uh, attempt as best as possible to take these requests, um, to serve these requests. Um, so CPUs is pretty straightforward. Uh, and memory is a number followed by a suffix, which is the um, whether it's gigabytes or megabytes. Um, disks uh, actually has three parts. That's the mount point. Um, there's this often used kind of shortcut called local disk, local dash disk, which just says, give me some space on the local disk. It doesn't matter where it is. And then a size in gigabytes and a type. And the types, two types that are typically recognized are SSD for a solid state drive or HDD for a, a traditional hard disk drive. There are also engine specific keys. For example, on DNA Nexus, you can hard code a specific instance type to use using the DX instance type key. So here's an example of a runtime section that defines, that asks for four CPUs, 10 gigs of memory, and 10 gigs of solid, uh, solid state drive disk space mounted at the slash temp. So one of the cool things about Will is that uh, runtime, uh, the runtime section is evaluated dynamically at runtime, which is kind of implied by the name. And this means that you can determine your resource requirements dynamically. Um, so what this means is that you could pass in the name of your Docker image as an input parameter um, and then specify that in the runtime. So here I'm passing in Docker image as a string. Um, if I, uh, actually that should be an optional value, sorry about that. Um, and then it's determining um, what the actual value of that is by saying if the user defines the Docker image, use that one. Otherwise by default, use this particular Docker image which has SAM tools. 
And then in the runtime section, I'm just pointing uh, uh, the Docker key at this value that I've defined. And so what this means is I can write my Docker task or my Whittle task once, and I can update my Docker image any number of times I want. For example, if a new version of SAM tools comes out, and all I have to do is change my inputs to pass the new uh, Docker image to the task. Um, similarly, I can use uh, variables to define the CPU or the disk space requirement. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that when you're running a, a Whittle task on uh, DNA Nexus, you can pass in the file ID of a Docker image stored on the, on the DNA Nexus platform using the dx colon slash slash uh, URL form. So I could pass this in as the value of this Docker image string, and dxwiddle will be smart enough to go and download this file and use that as the Docker image rather than pulling an image from a repository. <clears throat> and so one of the cool things you can do is base the, for example, the amount of disk space that your task needs on the size of your input file. So here I'm passing an array of BAM files. If I know that I'm going to be you know, copying all these BAM files to my instance, I know that I at least need the amount, uh, the total size of all these BAM files. I need that much disk space to store them. And let's say that my, um, my task is gonna be generating a new BAM file that's just gonna be a concatenation of these BAM files. Then I probably need at least two times as much uh, as the input disk space um, to, or input file size, uh, that much disk space to store them. So I can write this math expression, which takes, uh, uses the size function to get the size of each of the BAM files, and then sums them up using the sum function, multiplies them by two, and then I have to convert, this is a floating point number, so I have to convert it back to an integer, and I use the ceiling function, which just rounds this up to the next highest integer to get the amount of disk space that I'm going to request. So this makes your tasks a lot more, uh, a lot safer because they won't, uh, it'll be much less likely to fail for out of disk space. Um, and if you do a similar type of calculation for memory, you, know, you can try and protect them against failing due to out of memory errors as well. Uh, another part of Whittle tasks um, that are completely optional, but nice to do, nice to define are metadata sections. So you have the meta section that is for, um, for uh, task, uh, task or workflow level um, metadata. And then you have the parameter meta, which defines metadata for each of the input parameters. Um, and these keys, again, are arbitrary and ignored if the engine doesn't recognize them. But uh, we can put some interesting information in here. For example, DNA Nexus, uh, DX Whittle has the convention that if you put in the type native uh, a key value pair and then an ID with an applet ID, then instead of using a Docker image uh, for your task, you can use an existing DNA Nexus app or applet uh, uh, instead. So this gives you access to all of the apps already defined on the DNA Nexus platform, as well as any applets you've already written. Um, you can use those directly rather than having to convert those to Docker images. Within parameter meta, um, I can, um, of course, document what each of the parameters means, but I can also um, use this uh, object notation so I can add a little bit more information. For example, if I wanted to say that the extension of the spam file has to be .bam, I could add the key value pair for that. And we'll take advantage of that for another cool feature on DNA Nexus, which is input streaming. Um, streaming is supported by Cromwell as well in a little bit different fashion, which I'll describe. So what streaming means is that if I have a, a file where I don't really need to download the entire file to the worker before I can start using it, then rather than wait for that whole file to download, I can stream that file and start my task right away. So the types of operations where 
this will work are things like um, untarring or unzipping a file because that's done linearly from the start to the end of the file. Um, or even uh, paired end or single end read alignment using something like BWA because BWA is going to start from the beginning of the FASTQ file and proceed linearly to the end. So in these cases, we can stream the files. Um, unfortunately, because these keys are arbitrary, there's no standard. Uh, DX Whittle and Cromwell were developing this feature at about the same time and came up with different keywords. Um, this will hopefully be standardized to a single um, way of doing things in the future. But for right now, if I want to support both DX Whittle and Cromwell, I have to define stream as true and localization optional as true. Stream true is the DNA nexus way of doing things. Localization optional is the Cromwell way of doing things. So in this particular example, I have two FASTQ files and an index. I'm streaming all of those. And then here in my command, you'll see that with the, uh, the only thing I'm doing with this index file is untarring it. So this is a good candidate for streaming. And then BWA mem is using those two FASTQ files as input for alignment. And again, reading them left to right a single time. So those are also a good candidate for streaming. Cromwell and DX, uh, DX Whittle actually do streaming a little bit differently. In Cromwell, you have the restriction that the files may only be accessed once in a linear fashion. Whereas on Dean and Nexus, we actually wrote um, a Fuse plugin, which is a, a file kind of a, a fake file system um, that makes a DNA Nexus project look like just another mount point on the Linux system uh, to, to the operating system. And what this does is it manages under the hood the actual streaming of the data from your DNA Nexus project. And so what this enables you to do is access the file in any manner, even a random access manner. So streaming is a bit less limited on the DNA Nexus versus Cromwell. And in fact, in the um, DX Whittle options that you can set, you can tell it just by default to stream all files, which, uh, which is safe to do now using this uh, Fuse-based streaming system. <clears throat> all right, so we've covered um, writing little tasks. The next thing to, to uh, cover now is how do we put those tasks together into a workflow. So we've already seen a bit of this. Our workflow has an input section. You can have metadata sections in your workflow as well. Uh, but the meat of the workflow is really calling tasks. So um, a simple call to a task is just done using the call keyword. So I get to call the sort.bam task. Here I'm using the import keyword to bring in a separate file called align.whittle, and I'm aliasing that as align. So align is now a new name in this workflow that I can access. And so here, if I want to call that align task, I call align.sortbam, assuming sortbam is a task within this align.whittle file. And this is really the way you get modularity in Whittle is through these import statements. Workflow offers two uh, more complex um, usage patterns. One is called scatter gather, and the other is called conditionals. In scatter gather, I use the scatter keyword, and I have an array of things that I want to scatter across. So let's say I have an array of samples, which I've defined here. I say scatter over samples so this is kind of like a for each statement so for each sample in the samples array i want to call this align.bwa mem task and pass it in some information that's specific to that sample i can also use this conditional so um, i have a variable here defined a boolean parameter input parameter sort by default set to true um, so if it's left set to true, this block will execute. If the user overrides it and defines it to, to false, this block then won't execute. And basically anything within this conditional block will run as long as the condition is true. So here I'm saying if sort is true, then I'm going to call a task that's going to sort my BAM file. 
And then I have to deal with this conditional. And again, I use our friend select first. And what I'm saying is um, select first of sort um, an output from sort fam. So if this task is run, then this sort fam dot sorted bam output parameter will be defined. Otherwise, I'll fall back to just taking the output bam file from our BWMM task. And then my output um, parameter can just reference this variable. So this is going to give me back um, an array of files because it's run within a scatter. So there's two parts to this, scatter and gather. The scatter is the only thing I need to worry about. The gather part is actually um, done implicitly. So Cromwell or the XWiddle or whatever the execution engine is, is just taking all of the outputs from all of the tasks run within the scatter and, and putting them together into an array. And that just happens automatically. All right, so there's my complete workflow. Now we can see how to compile this on DNA, DNA Nexus using DXWiddle. DXWiddle is also written in Java, and it actually uses parts of Cromwell um, under the hood. So we take advantage of all the advances that are made in Cromwell. I can download this from the DNA Nexus uh, GitHub page for DXWiddle. Um, just download the latest jar file. Again, I like to store this to an environment variable and then reference it uh, in my command string as java-jar, jar file and then the compile command. So the first argument to compile is the top level Whittle file that contains my workflow. And then I have some required parameters. Dash project specifies the DNA Nexus project where you want this file to be compiled. Dash folder specifies the folder within that project where you want this workflow to be uh, compiled. Um, optionally, I can give an inputs file with dash inputs. And what this does is if I have an inputs file in Cromwell format, it will um, output an inputs file, the same, the same inputs, but in a slightly different JSON format required uh, by DNA Nexus. Um, this extras uh, option allows me to pass in a JSON file with some extras. I'm not going to go into all of what I can do here. This is fully documented in the DXWiddle um, GitHub site. Uh, but essentially, I can override any of the um, parameters that I would have access to if I was writing a native DNA Nexus workflow, the things that are defined in the dxapp.json. I can provide those here for the tasks and workflow that I'm writing. Um, and there's some other extras that can be configured. For example, if you want to pull Docker images from a private Docker repository, you can specify uh, your credentials within this extras.json file. And then the last option um, is either uh, dash archive or dash f. Dash archive, if I've already compiled this workflow before, it will take all of the existing uh, workflow and apps and put those in a special archive folder. So I always have a backup. If I do dash F, then it will just overwrite the existing apps and workflows. And I put a link to that, that extra expert options page here uh, also within the slides. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then the final step, once I've compiled that workflow, the output of this compile command is just gonna be a workflow ID. And now I can run this like any other DNA Nexus workflow using DX run. And remember that I said we can pass in this inputs file and it's going to output a file in the, in the corresponding file in the, in the right format, DNA Nexus. And then I can just take that file and pass it to DX run using the dash F parameter. And here's what that input file looks like. Um, a bit different format than the Cromwell uh, input um, the um, namespace of the DNA Nexus workflow is actually um, this kind of special app that's generated called uh, common. And so it's essentially just replacing the workflow name with stage common. Uh, we refer to DNA Nexus files by um, IDs rather than paths. So that's what this, um, this little construct is with this special dollar sign DNA Nexus link key. And then um, 
there's also there also may be a section here, for example, if you're using structs, where you have to give uh, dxwiddle a list of the file any files that are used in those nested um, data types, and this is just uh, to let it know uh, what files it needs to close when the workflow is is done. So um, a lot of details in here that you don't really need to worry about if you use the dash input. Uh, input uh, parameter to dxwiddle, it'll generate the file in the right format, and then you just need to kind of use this as a template and you know, find and replace these file IDs with the correct ones for your particular um, invocation. Okay, so we're almost uh, out of time here. I just wanted to touch on one last thing, which is the fact that once you have a workflow, um, it's becoming more and more common and I believe very important to test your workflows to make sure, first of all, that they run, um, they run at all without error, but also to make sure that they're running reproducibly so you can give it a, a set of inputs and it's generating the expected set of outputs every time. And this is such a, a common usage pattern that we actually, uh, with a, one of our clients, Eli Lilly, partnered to write this testing framework called PyTestWiddle. It's an open source uh, framework that's available on Eli Lilly's GitHub site. And it uses, uh, essentially how it works is you write a fairly simple test defining uh, some test inputs and some expected outputs. And PyTestWiddle manages running your Whittle workflow on those inputs and checking, against, checking the actual outputs against the expected outputs. Uh, right now, it uses Cromwell to do that, but um, we're developing support right now to, you know, to support other execution engines like MiniWiddle and DXWiddle. So as I mentioned, this uh, a workflow test is um, first going to prepare some input files. Your input files might be stored remotely. You could put them on GitHub or some other kind of file server. You can even store them in DNA Nexus. And so the first step is going to copy those files to your local computer. Then it's going to call the workflow executor and wait for it to complete. If it failed, then it'll give you back an informative error message. Otherwise, it will gather the outputs of the workflow and compare them against some expected values. And it raises assertion errors that the expected and actual outputs don't match. Outputs are compared by default using um, MD5 hash values if we expect the outputs to be uh, the actual and the expected outputs to be identical. But there are some scenarios where you expect them to differ by a little bit. And so you can even say that two files should differ by one or two lines. And we even go a little bit further for certain types of files like BAMs and BCFs. There's more complex comparison should, that should be done. Um, and, and so these are. Um, these are kind of special comparisons that we implement. And all of this is pluggable, so you can override these or write your own comparators for the different types of files that you're working with. So a project with tests in it would kind of look like this. I would have my, my workflows, and then I would have a test directory, which has at least two files, a test file written in Python and a test data file in JSON format. My data file defines any number of, um, of test data files, and um, I can put a location for these test data files. For example, this is a file stored on DNA Nexus with this file ID. These files are gonna be copied locally to a cache directory. By default, that cache directory is just a temporary directory, but you can specify an alternative location using a configuration file. And this path would just be, uh, this is an optional path by default, just the name of the file is used, but you can define a different local path um, for your test data files. And then, so these would all be input uh, test data files, and then this is an expected output. Um, this is the BAM file that we're gonna be comparing against. I can define its uh, type as BAM, and this will ensure that the special BAM comparison method is used. And I can say that we expect one line uh, to be different between the actual and the expected outputs. And then each test that I want to write just looks like this. So I write a Python function using these two special inputs, workflow data and workflow runner. These are fixtures. So this is um, PyTestWiddle is a plugin to the PyTest 
framework. Um, I won't get into what fixtures are, but essentially these two um, uh, objects are provided by the PyTest Wordle plugin. Workflow data allows you to access the, the test data that you defined in that JSON file, and Workflow Runner manages um, the details of calling the execution engine and doing the, the uh, comparisons between the expected and actual values. So then here I just prepare a dictionary with my uh, inputs and my expected outputs, and pass those to the workflow runner along with the name of the Whittle workflow. And if all goes well, um, this is what an execution of this will look like. Um, PyTest Whittle needs to know the location of the Cromwell jar. There's some other um, environment variables and things that I can set. And I know that I'm moving fast here. Uh, this is all fully documented. If you go to the PyTest Whittle GitHub page and link to the documentation, all of these different configuration and usage options are, are fully spelled out. Uh, so I would just call then PyTest. Uh, PyTest takes care of locating the DX Whittle plugin and and running all of my tests. And so I wrote one test here and <clears throat> it uh, passed, so I get this nice green screen. So if you um, are interested in testing your workflows, I, I strongly recommend checking out uh, PyTest Whittle and um, you can ask for help or ask for feature uh, additions through the GitHub site. And with that, I will wrap up and take any questions that you have. Thank you very much for attending and for your uh, attention and interest. Great. Thank you, John, for that uh, presentation. As a reminder, um, if you do have any questions, please just type them in the Q&A box down at the bottom. Um, if we don't have time to address all the questions today, uh, we'll follow up with you individually via email. Um, John, the first question that I have uh, for you is, uh, what's a strategy to back execution. Sure, so um, one way you can batch executions if you're using DNA Nexus is using kind of the built-in support for batch uh, workflows. So we have a way to define um, a group of inputs that are, are batched for a specific input parameter to the workflow and then DNA Nexus execution engine just handles running all of those in parallel. Uh, with Cromwell, there's uh, different facilities for doing batch, or you can even write kind of a, a wrapper workflow. That's the batch workflow. So your wrapper workflow would just do a scatter gather and call your, um, your sub workflow on each sample uh, separately. So several different ways to address that. All right, great. And um, can I hold the execution of one task until a previous task is completed? Sure. So. Um, uh, that's actually handled automatically in Whittle. So in Whittle, you set up dependencies between tasks by referring to the, the outputs of one task uh, as the inputs to another task. So Whittle will then just kind of build an execution graph and figure out which things it can run in parallel and which things it has to wait on until certain, uh, certain tasks are completed before it can run other ones. All right, great. And then it looks like we have one more question. Um, as I mentioned, if anyone has any final ones, uh, we can address those by email. Uh, but this last one is, if I call bash exit one from within a command block in Whittle, will that cause issues in Cromwell? Right, so calling exit one, uh, any, any return code that's not zero will cause, cause your task to fail. There are some cases where exit one might be expected. For example, if you do grep with the dash C, to um, count the number of occurrences of something in a, in a file, and there are no occurrences of that thing in a file, then grep will exit with a return code of one, even though that might be an expected result. So Cromwell actually has a, uh, a configuration option that says um, what the accepted return codes are for each task. So for that task, you would just say that one would be an acceptable return code, and then it would uh, succeed. Okay, thank you. And uh, with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you all for your attendance today and uh, look out for the recording of this as well as uh, part one of this webinar series via email. Uh, thank you, John. Yeah, thank you.